Hi, my name is Brian Powers and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project. And today is September 10th, 2014, and we're in Cincinnati, in Cincinnati, Ohio, and we're in the home of Gus Smith, who's a World War II veteran. Mr. Smith, thank you very much for doing this interview. Thank you. And uh, we like, always like to start out with a hard question. We always like to start out with, where were you born? I was born here in Cincinnati, in Price Hill, um, and lived in Price Hill until about 1950, except when I got an offer from the government I couldn't refuse. <laughs> well, can you tell us a little bit about your family? Are you from a, <coughs> did you have a lot of brothers and sisters or? I had no brothers and sisters. My father died when I was eight years old. Uh, although uh, he came from a large family and so did my mother. So I had a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins. And they all lived in Cincinnati? All but one. Um, and so it was just you and your mother who lived in a house? Exactly. Now, did she have to work or did somebody else was helping? No, my father had provided enough for her that, and me that uh, she could get along without working. So what schools did you go to when you were I went to Carson School from K to 6, then Western Hills. I was part of the 13th graduating class in 1941. And then I went to UC for two years and then went to work for the government. So. One of the questions we like to ask people is, uh, do you remember what you were doing when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes. I was returning from a gig in, uh, where was it? Huh. Out this way someplace. A, oh, it was Glendale. There was a group in Glendale was putting on a show and a friend and I were hired as part of the orchestra. And there was a rehearsal that Sunday afternoon. And that's when I heard about it. You were at the rehearsal? I was coming home. What kind of, you were, you were, you were a musician at that time? Well, I, I played clarinet and sax, yes. Did you, did you do a lot of that when you were in high school and after high school? In high school, I did a lot of it. I did a bit of it, well, a good bit of it, in uh, college in the band. And I did a good bit of it during parts of my time in the military. Were you uh, formally trained in music? Did, could you read music? And I could read and play, yes, I was formally trained. Uh, and played a number of the different clarinets and saxophones. So now we'd like to get to the, the part where Uncle Sam calls you up. So uh, I'm assuming that you didn't enlist. I'm assuming maybe you might have got drafted. I got drafted. I got deferments to finish the second year of uh, college. And uh, then I couldn't come up with another excuse to stay out, so uh, I was drafted. And where did you uh, report to? Reported at Fort Thomas um, in Kentucky and was there for about four weeks, again playing in a band there. And then moved, was transferred to uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. And that's where you were doing your basic training? I did Knox. basic training there, yes. So uh, what I can see here that you were, uh, you also were there at Fort Knox to do armored radio school? I went after uh, basic training. I was in the um, armored school, in the radio school. Is there, is there, uh, did you get, placed in that? I mean, did you have some aptitude that you got placed for a radio operator? That's rather interesting. <clears throat> I remember taking four 
aptitude tests, and I remember my scores. The general aptitude test, I got a 141. The mechanical aptitude test, I got 142. The clerical aptitude test, I got 144. The radio aptitude test, I got 119. So I ended up in radio school. <laughs> that was the government at work there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, but do you have much memories of Fort Knox, what that was like when you were there? Yes, I have a lot of them, and most of it was pleasant. I was f kind of fortunate. My uh, platoon sergeant, who was a regular there, got himself into some trouble and was busted and sent overseas about the third week of training. And I was called in and asked, you've had ROTC. Can you lead close order drill? Do you know the manual of arms? And I said, yes, I did. He said, all right, you're going to take over the platoon. You still got to do all the basic work, but you will be pl platoon sergeant. Well, Lance Sergeant, maybe. Yeah. And so I did. The only big advantage to that was I got the private room at the end of the barracks. <laughs> um. So you were there for for how long in Fort Knox altogether from basic training and your radio training? From <coughs> October until hmm, July. Now, I've talked to other radio guys, but I don't think I've talked to anybody who was an armored radio operator. What 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 did that mean? Uh, being it meant we worked in in an armored vehicle, or we were with armored division. It was the same training, uh, except we had some different radios to learn how to hook up in the vehicles. And, um, well, that was about the only difference. We, um, you agreed down further there, I went back into radio school overseas. And this was with an armored group and an infantry group, so we were learning the same things, um, but it was just armored. So were you a uh, radio operator like in a tank? Pardon? Or were you like uh, doing radio operation for like a, I always think of armored division, I always think of tanks. Well, tanks, armored cars, half tracks, uh, even some peeps, we, um, we would do it every place, but armored cars or armored divisions are essentially uh, mounted in vehicles. So uh, then you uh, eventually, it looks like you went to Fort Meade? Fort Meade, yes. And what were you doing in Fort Meade? What were you training for? Well, we were waiting to go overseas, but a few of us got bored so we volunteered to work in the armory, cleaning uh, weapons, guns that the officers used for practice. And um, this was a good deal. We'd work eight hours and then have 12 off, except on the weekends, we'd work eight hours and get 72 off so we could get passes to go into Baltimore, Washington, Atlantic City, New York. And that went on for five or six weeks, I guess. And, and then um, it looks like you got sent to England. How did you get transport? Did you go by? Uh, by boat, the Ile de France, which was the slowest boat to travel un out of convoy. Did you, was there much concern at that point for U-boats in, in 44? 
It looked like you were there in September 44. Was that there still was a concern? much concern. The boat was constantly zigzagging to avoid them. And as we approached Ireland, we were supposed to come up through the Irish Sea. But there was a couple of U-boats behind us. So a few of the British naval vessels escorted us around the west side of Ireland, bringing us into Scotland. Was there a procedure you had to follow, or follow if there was a, a U-boat sighting? No, we weren't even supposed to know it. That is, those of us down in the holes. <laughs> Didn't want to make you nervous, I guess, huh? I'm afraid it would have. <laughs> so did you go to Scotland? You ended up we going... We landed at Gorick, Scotland, which is just outside of Halifax, of, uh, yeah. Glasgow? Glasgow. Um, and we, did you do any kind of training there, or were you just sort of waiting to, to move, move we on? We got off the ship at Glasgow or at uh, Gurk, we got on a train that came south to Southampton and about noon the next day we were on another ship headed for France. So when you get to France it says that you went to uh, Signal Corps school. Did you, is that what you immediately did when you arrived there? No. Um, Mainly we, when well, it took five or six days by train to go about 200 miles to get to Fontainebleau. And they had a whole bunch of replacements they didn't know what to do with. So I was, oh, about four or five weeks and they shipped us to another little town Etrechy in France, where we went to this radio school that had been set up for 20 people who were armored and 20 who were infantry. And the idea was they were to be taught uh, low, to become low speed operators. There was another fellow and me who were already low speed operators. They were going to try to make high-speed operators out of us. Can you describe the difference between what a, a low-speed operator is and a high-speed operator? It's the rate at which you can send and receive messages. I'm not real sure what the rates are now, but I think it was 10 or 12 words a minute for low speed and someplace around 18 to 20 for high speed, but I'm not sure of that anymore. And I'm, I'm guessing all these messages that you were sending were, were encoded in some way? Yes. Did you do the encoding or was somebody else do the encoding? We had a little box that was an encoder and you you set it up each day for a different code and everybody who would be apt to receive a message or send you a message set their box up the same way. And then you would pump the message in and it would come out with a, a jumble of letters that after you sent it and it was received and you fed it back into the box, you got a message. How would you feed the message in? Were you typing it in or was it, or how? Uh, how yes, you, you copied it in and it came back out as a message. Was there like some sort of keyboard interface thing that you used? There was, and I don't remember what it looked like. It wasn't like a typewriter. So you were there, you were, so you were being trained there, uh, it says here about maybe for eight weeks eight at weeks. that school? Well, when you were in France, when you initially got there, I don't know what, which way you came in, but did you go to the same where, where a lot of the combat had happened for D-Day? Yes, we came in at what was Omaha Beach then climbed up the hill and 
set up camp on in a field at the top of the hill in the rain. So when you were there, this was a few months after the D-Day invasion. Was there a lot of uh, a lot of evidence of of that when you, still around when you got there? Or was that clear? There was a up? good bit of wreckage around, and the uh, the docks weren't very large. In fact, there were very few of them. We had to come in on uh, LSTs, uh, and there was, yes, a lot of evidence of uh, fighting that had taken place, um, including uh, the higher up uh, bunkers that the Germans had been using to fire down on it. And uh, how long were you camped there on the hill? Two days, maybe three, till they got a train ready of 40 and 8 to take us wherever it was we were going. Were you, uh, were you allowed to walk around that area or were they afraid there might be landmines or something? Uh... We had to be very careful. There were landmines. There were a couple of fellows who stepped on them and got pretty well banged up. Oh, people that you you were traveling with in your unit? Well, there were, yes, people we were traveling with, some several hundred of them. So when did you get assigned to the, to your, to the, were you in the second? Fifth Army? Armored. First Armored. When did, it, when did that happen? Second of January in uh, 1945. And I think they had gone through D-Day, I think. Yes. No, yes, they had. No, they came up from uh, Italy. Okay. They had been in Africa and came up from Italy. Or maybe it's the second division that did that. Second division. So, so after you, were, uh, you got qualified as a high-speed radar operator, where did they send you next? Well, they sent me to Second Armor or to Fifth Armor Division. Okay, and I was put with the 85th Armored Reconnaissance as a a, a radio operator in a headquarters company, traveling at the very end of the convoy with the maintenance people. I was the rear contact with the front end of. Uh, our unit at slow speed radio operation. There were only two of us in the uh, squadron who were high speed. Was that, were you guys involved much with the Battle of the Bulge? Because that was kind of going on around January We 45. were in reserve. We were in Belgium, um, right, well, close to Aachen in, uh, in Germany. And it, oh, it was close by. If things had gotten any worse, we probably would have been called up. So where were you, where you were at, was it, it was probably pretty cold, pretty it wintry? It was very cold and snowy. And we were in a forest in pup tents. How did, how did you uh, try to keep warm? <laughs> well, I was brought in after the other people were there, and I noticed the mistakes they made. So what I, I did is I cleared out an area to put my pup tent in. I was able to get a couple of cans of sterno and I covered the tent with snow, turned on the sterno, which melted the snow, and then froze the canvas. And then I put snow over that, and I was fairly comfortable. Um, so how, how long were you there in, in uh, Belgium at that, at, at that campsite? About a month. 
So you were there when it was pretty, it, you were in those conditions for, for the whole four, time. Three or four weeks. And um, I was getting to know my, my associates. I had never been in a, uh, a travel situation. But it, it was interesting. We, we had one hour of guard duty every night. And night started about four o'clock in the afternoon because it got dark early. But one of the things we had to do is get into, oh, each guard had about five vehicles. And after you were relieved, you got into those vehicles started them up. If it was a wheeled vehicle, you moved it back and forth. If it was a track vehicle, you'd move it the length of the track so they wouldn't freeze to the ground. And every hour as we changed guard, um, this had to happen again. So it was a busy night. The days we were busy just chopping wood to stay warm. Did, did you do much radio operating in that time? None. You were just trying to stay warm? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the chief radio operator, he was making contact, but the rest of us didn't have to do anything. Did you see many natives, like Belgian people, in that area when you were there? Or? Not there, but I did uh, later. Uh, that was before I got there. I spent five days with a Belgian family who were very, very nice to us. In fact, I kept contact with them up until about oh, 20, 30 years ago. How did you make contact with them initially? We were assigned to their house. They had to bed us down. It was a um, parents with two daughters in their 20s and two sons, one about 15 and one about 12. And the 15-year-old spoke very good English. Both of the girls were shy about speaking English but understood it. So we got along very well. Did you ever pick up any, any French when you were there? Well, I learned enough to get myself in and out of trouble, but that was about <laughs> it. I uh, used it mostly on passes and uh, furlough. Yeah. Um, so where did you go after Belgium? We went into Germany. Uh, and we're in and around Aachen. Uh, mentioned Gladbach, uh, that area, and then began to move. Uh, you never knew where or when until you got there. Were you guys part of Patton's Third Army at that point, or no? You never. We were the Ninth Army. Okay. Um, did you cross the Rhine River? We crossed the Rhine on Easter Sunday. We were concerned that we wouldn't make it, that we'd be there too early. And we wanted to cross on Easter. And fortunately, there was a convoy of trucks coming back for supplies that held us up so we could cross on Easter. Just barely Easter Sunday, but Easter Sunday. W was that an actual German bridge or was that something that the, the military That was a made? pontoon bridge. Yeah. Because I think the Germans were trying to blow up all those bridges. I think there was one left, I think. There was one left that that was hmm, west of us, I think. Uh -huh. So what was it like crossing the platoon bridge? Was it, was it creaky or? Did it <laughs> well, it was a little bumpy. Uh, I was in an armored car. Well, that's what I was going to say. Those are pretty, pretty heavy vehicles. Was there concern yeah. that? Or they're, they're all designed that it's not going to be a problem? <laughs> no, it wasn't a problem getting across, except uh, uh, the pontoons would go up and down as your weight shifted. And there were peeps ahead of us. Now, 
Maybe I ought to clear this up now. I'm talking about Peeps. That was the quarter-ton vehicle that the armor people called Peeps. It was originally designed for the armor, but the rest of the army, and particularly the Air Force, got them too, and they didn't like the term Peep. They called it a Jeep. <laughs> well, for us, a Jeep was the three-quarter ton truck. The general purpose truck, which we called the GP. So the GP for us wasn't Jeep, it was general purpose. And the quarter ton that everybody else called a Jeep, we called a Peep. And the amphibian quarter ton, we called a Seep, because they always leak. <laughs> and uh, how many vehicles, do you remember how many vehicles you had and how many had to cross the bridge and how long that took? Mm. Our squadron, or, yeah, no, let's back up. Our, we had four two and a half ton trucks. What did that say? He's got some notes that'll Thir help us here. Thirteen? Page thirteen is where it's kind of where he is in the, in the talking about the oh. and the and So how long did it take for your whole unit to cross the bridge? Was it an all day thing? I don't know. I don't know when the first one oh. started, and I don't know when the <laughs> last one got by. And you guys are just traveling, and uh, when you stopped, where would you sleep? You just had tents to sleep in? Didn't have time. Uh, you learn to sleep in the vehicle, and you are on the vehicle. A good place to sleep on an armored car was on the back end over the motor because it would be warm if you'd been traveling. But a lot of times you had to stay inside. And uh, an armored car normally carried four people. Ours only had three. A driver, an assistant driver, radio operator, which was me, and uh, a car commander who was the... Uh, staff sergeant or chief sergeant of the maintenance crew. We didn't have a, um, a gunner because we didn't have a fourth person to put in there. So if it became necessary, the driver would move up and become gunner, and I would move over and become driver and radio operator at the same time. So long as it was voice radio, I couldn't do code and undrive at the same time. Was there? Did you guys have your own fuel with you? How would you? How how much? How how often did you have to keep refueling your vehicle? They would bring fuel to us in a five-gallon. I'm sorry, forty-gallon um, tanks. What they call them, GI tanks. Uh, a two and a half ton truck would come just loaded with these and he'd go up and down and you would say all right I need two or I need one uh, and you'd get them you'd load it up and you'd drop them by the side of the road and that truck would come back and pick them all up again and take them back to be refilled did you guys have like a system that make it as fast as you can so you weren't holding up anybody behind you? Well, everybody stopped at the same time. Okay. If you couldn't keep moving, you pulled off to the side and then tried to catch up. And that's what my job as radio operator was, was to notify the 
uh, front end of the column that such and such a vehicle had dropped out. Maintenance was taken care of it. Okay. Were you running into many uh, German soldiers at that point, like people who were like surrendering or anything? Yes, we did. We were in a, guarding a bridge, uh, and I was one of four people there. When I see this huge line of Germans marching toward us, well, we figured the best thing to do was find a safe place to at least be prepared. And as we noticed, they were all lined up according to rank. The field officers, or the line officers, the higher ranking, and on back. And they got close to the bridge and we yelled to them to stop. And we saw they had a, were waving a white flag. So then a few of the officers came forward with the flag. They said they've come to surrender. Well, we couldn't do anything with them. There were only four of us, and so we couldn't leave our post. So we told them how to get to the uh, headquarters where they were collecting prisoners and just watched them go around. There must have been 250 of them. Do you have much impression? Like, wasn't that near the end they had a lot of young kids? Did you, yeah, did you have was, much impressions of what they looked like, the soldiers? They looked like we looked after we had spent three or four days in the mud. Uh, they were dirty, they were ragged. Uh, some of them had dirty uh, patches and uh, bandages on them. They were not in the best of shape. Even the uh, officers in front looked pretty tired. Was that your, your first encounter with German? troops or you had, had you had encounters before? We had a couple of singles that we would capture or um, we had a couple of German girls that were going by on a bicycle every day at the same time and we wondered why this was. So I followed them. We discovered that they were taking food to some uh, soldiers who were just hiding and finally we just stopped them and said they can't go there anymore and then they admitted what they were doing and we were able to get them but uh, that was the only encounter. Um, Tell about your um, organized looting. Well, that came later. Uh, well, let's let's hear it. The organized what we called organized looting. Uh, we get into a town, and we didn't know what we had. So, the idea was we had to go into each home to see if there was anything that would be of assistance to the enemy. Uh, and I was one of two in our company who uh, could speak some German, high school German. And we would go into a house and the first thing I would do was have all of the people in that house come to one room. Then I would tell them what we were looking for we were looking for radio transmitters, cameras, anything that was suggestive of the Nazi party, books like Mein Kampf, uh, if they had them. This, we'd take one man, he would take our group of about four people to get them. 
all this stuff and bring it back. Um, one place they that we don't have a thing. But that didn't look right because first thing I saw was a picture of a um, naval officer. So we went around and did an inspection. First thing we got to was a door that was locked. Oh, the person that lives there is gone. We don't have the key. So they kicked the door in, or we kicked the door in. And we found all sorts of things. One of them I got was a great, big, huge Nazi flag. Uh, and uh, a, a copy of Mein Kampf. Uh, there were several cameras, radio. <clears throat> well, the people didn't expect us to go in there, and they saw what we were showing them, and they thought surely we we're going to take them out and shoot them. But we just took the stuff, sent it down back, if, if you got it, you could keep it. Um, and then we went to this other room that was locked, and suddenly there was a key for that one. But that one was, was okay. But we did that for, oh, four or five days in this place. And that improved my German a good bit. <laughs> Yes, there was one place I would stay with the families and she wanted to know if it would be all right if she could ask me a question. We weren't supposed to fraternize at this one. And I knew they were frightened. I said, okay. And she started to speak and she got excited and spoke faster and faster and faster. I stopped her told her to start again, more, more lonesome, speak slower. So she started out slower and sped up again. And I stopped her the second time. And then she made some comment about me saying I can speak German and I couldn't even understand it. That kind of ticked me off. And I think in the most perfect German I ever spoke, I told her that I wasn't supposed to speak to her in the first place. I'm trying to make her a little more comfortable and trying to help. Well, she backed off. She was very apologetic and said, could she try again? I said, okay. Developed, she had a son who was a prisoner of war in West Virginia, and she wanted to know if I knew what it was like in West Virginia. I said, well, I've been there. I don't know what it was like for him, but I trade places with him right now. <laughs> that made her feel a little bit better. And a couple of days later, I saw her on the street, and she was very polite, and I come to learn her name was Schmidt, just like mine. <laughs> no relative, though. Um, I was wondering, when you were going into these houses, did you were you trained to do that before, or we were given uh, about a forty-five minute uh, lecture of what we were to look for, what we were not to touch. Uh, we were not. We were to leave radio receivers alone. Do not touch any uh, silverware or uh, oh, China, anything of value to them, only if it was of military value to them. And that was the extent of the training. <coughs> So, um, do you, all this time, you're going east, but you're not sure, do you assume you're going to Berlin? No, uh, we didn't have that idea at all then. Uh, we were in a little town when the war ended, uh, and 
Um, I had some reason to go into division headquarters. I think it was to take a physical, I don't remember. But I got in there and everybody was going wild. They'd all brought out the bottles they'd saved for these years. And so I had nothing to do to go back where I was and we hadn't any bottles. So we had to celebrate as best we could by running up the blackout shades and turning the lights on and driving around at night with the headlights on, which was celebration enough, I guess. Well, I was going to ask, do you remember uh, when FDR died, getting that news? Yes. Um, We were in a convoy, and um, the, I picked up some news. I was just playing around on the radio, and I picked up some news that was coming from, supposed to be out of Georgia. And said the um, president had died. That didn't ring true with me. So I kept listening. I got a Belgian station that was broadcasting in English, in an English station. And yeah, I finally got it through that, that he had died. And this was kind of rough time. It, it kind of knocked the pins out of from under us. Now, we weren't all great Roosevelt supporters, but after all, he, he was the chief. And so it, it was kind of demoralizing. And it, 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 what did you, when you heard the, the new guy, his name was Truman, we were like, who's that? <laughs> no, we, we knew that. Uh, after all, we had we voted that year before. Of course, we were didn't you get our... That, you were in France, though, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, we didn't get our ballots until January. <laughs> so what we did, we were going to be able to send them back. We voted for everybody that lost and sent them back. <laughs> <laughs> well, did they ever explain why they came so late? They just... Uh... Well, we were replacements. And we were constantly moving. And uh, our mail never caught up with us. I mean, this place would say, well, he was here. He went there. So they said that there, well, he was here. Now he's someplace else. <laughs> and it just kept pushing around. And they didn't hurry to do that. They knew things were old. Hey, I'm looking here. You had some uh, Mickey Rooney came through. He came through on a, a peep. He had a driver, and that's all he was supposed to do was to be there. Uh, he told some jokes, some stories, had chow with us, and got out a clarinet and began trying to play it. The worst clarinet player I think I ever heard. <laughs> but he was entertaining and it was something to talk about and write home about. Was he just hanging around the troops or was he actually on a stage? No, he wasn't on stage. He just moved around in the vehicle. He'd find some guys in a bunch. He'd stop and talk to them <laughs> and move on. And he, he did more good that way than if he'd have been on a stage, I think. I guess you didn't get to chat to him about the clarinet or anything. You didn't, no. You didn't give I, any tips? <laughs> no, he, he was better off playing the way he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to ask if, did you, 
go to any of the any of the concentration camps? Did you encounter any of those? Yes. Uh, we were close to Buchenwald at the end of the war, and you know Eisenhower put out that order that everyone that could possibly visit a camp um, be taken to one. And we went to Buchenwald about four, three, four days after it was liberated. We were given a couple of orders. First, do not give any of the uh, people who were there food. And second, do not give them any cigarettes. They were afraid if they got food, it would kill them because of the diet they've had. And uh, that was one of the saddest, that was the worst day of my life at, in the Army, was just seeing what was going on. And there was a holocaust. Now, Buchenwald had only men and boys. And there were reports where they were sleeping four and five in a bunk. And we asked about that, and they said, yes, it was true. In the winter, they had a whole new raft of prisoners come in, and they had to do something with them. They couldn't leave them out in the cold. So they brought them in and doubled and tripled up. There was usually, the bump bunk was made for four, and they were four tiers high. And all the food, it made them big vats. Um, and we got into where they did the cremating, and just the people were so sad. Most of them were taken out. The worst ones were gone. And just some doctors and some um, oh, medics of other types were there to bridge the gap until they could get them out of there. I'm, I'm not familiar with that camp. I've been to Dachau, but it, was this was, it, was that camp near a village or anything, or was it more isolated? No, it wasn't isolated. It was in a fairly uh, built-up area. Uh, it was was that close to Mühlhausen? No, near oh, Weimar. Weimar, all right. And um, yeah, that. Uh, People should have known what was going on. It may mean not how bad it was, but it was more than a prisoner of war camp. Mm -hmm. Did you go into that village? Did you walk around? We were in so many villages and big towns. Even got into the town my grandfather was born in. <laughs> that ended up in the eastern zone, but um, yeah, that was an experience too, as I tried to find some of my family. No luck? Did, you, did you have any luck or did you have Well, I, first I went to the uh, adjutant general's office to get permission. There was still the uh, non-fraternization, and I got permission to hunt for them. I went to the telephone book. I wasn't looking for Schmitz because I figured they might be gone, but there were other names that I knew, and I found them in a uh, phone book from 1936 or 37 with uh, a phone number, and then they were listed again later in a later book, but I had nothing to go on. I had learned later 
Had I gone to speak to the chaplains, I'd have found them because the chaplains were living in their home. <laughs> uh, How'd you find that out? Well, later? Uh, we had contact with them after the war, not directly, but uh, through a cousin who was born in Germany, came here with her parents, went to school here, and for her high school graduation, she got to go back to visit her grandmother, and she got interred, and she couldn't get back out. And so we, I thought she was there, but she had moved to Berlin by then, and that was my excuse to hunt for the family to find her, because we didn't know what her status was. She couldn't take out American citizenship when she was, because she wasn't old enough when she left, but her parents were citizens, and her brother became a citizen when he joined the Army. Um, were you aware of like the talent and everything before you went to Germany, or were you aware of your, of your German roots? Well, I was aware were... of my family and the town, uh, and uh, yes. I knew what I was looking for if I got there, or at least I knew I was looking for that town. And uh, my ability to move around was very limited. So when it was V, uh, when you heard the war was over, was that the same day as? Uh, VE Day, or was that a little later? No, that was VE Day as far as we were concerned. So when when it was the war was declared over in Europe, uh, what did you do? You were in Germany for a while as, as occupation army? I was in army. Germany for a while, and then I learned that they were breaking up the 5th Armored Division. It was going to be... Uh, sent back home and uh, deactivated. But many of us did not have enough points. We were uh, replacements, and some of us were replacing replacements. So we didn't get to go home. And I learned that I was going to be transferred to the second armored division. And that's what happened. I was moved to the 2nd Armored, and where the was 82nd Armored Cavalry. Where were they at? Hmm. I don't remember. Maybe we can dig it out of well, there. How did you meet up with them, I guess? How did you... Well, I, you know, the Army always tells you where to go. And, um, I, guess, I guess you weren't concerned, or were you concerned at any point that after... Uh, after the victory in Europe that you were going to get sent over to the Pacific Theater? I was concerned, yes. I had a thought of how to avoid it. I applied again for OCS. And I applied other times, but I couldn't pass the eye exam. And my eyes could not be corrected enough. So I applied again and was accepted all except for the physical. And I was set some distance away to uh, the Vision Medical Center for uh, the physical and the eye exam. This was, the war was still on then. And I got there and they were busy. And so they said, well, you got to get this eye exam. Go in this room and wait for us. And when one of us is free, we'll come in. So I went in there and I see there's an eye chart on the wall. I figure it doesn't do me any harm to try to memorize it. Also, there was a sterilizer in that, and it had run out of water and was starting to smolder. So I went out and f 
found somebody and told them about that. They came in and took care of that. But now the room was getting full of smoke. And finally, someone comes in to give me this eye exam. And I look, and it's a dentist. So he says, read this and read that. Well, of course I could read it then. So I passed the eye exam <laughs> and went back and now was waiting to be called up, hopefully to be sent back to the U.S. for training, which would get me back to Fort Knox again. Right. But uh, that didn't happen. They lost my papers. And then after the war, I reapplied, and either they went by the strength of what they thought my old papers were, but I was going to be sent back to the U.S. for training, and then to Pacific. And then the war in the Pacific was over, and I had as much trouble withdrawing my application for OCS as I did getting it in the first place. <laughs> well, how long were you over in Germany when, when, uh, when, the, when the war ended in Europe? How long were you over there still? Well, when the war ended there, I was in Germany until uh, Christmas of 44. But I was... Or you mean 45? 45, Christmas. yes. But I was transferred to the second armored, and we went into Berlin. Uh, when did you go into Berlin? We were supposed to arrive in Berlin on July 4th, but we had to go through the eastern zone, and the Russians did everything to delay us. So instead of getting in there early, we got in there pretty late, but still on the second. And they knew who was in every vehicle who went into Berlin. And the Russians what, did? No, we did. And the position of each vehicle, because there were many cities and uh, communities that had a prize for the first person of their area to be in Berlin. <laughs> so they knew who was the first one. Uh, I was the second, so I didn't come out quite as well. But it what didn't make any difference. Cincinnati didn't have any prizes or awards. Well, I was going to say, what was the prize? What, was, what kind of prize would you get, do you know? In Cincinnati, nothing. <laughs> so I don't know what the other ones were. <laughs> well, what were your impressions of Berlin when you went into Berlin? I <laughs> imagine an area here in Cincinnati from the river to Central Parkway, from Evanston, or, uh, Evanston to Central Avenue. Broadway is Central. Hmm? Broadway is Central. Well, let's go a little bit further. Without a building standing. Wow, that big of an area, huh? Parts of buildings, there's a wall standing, and on the third floor there was a door, and on that door there were a pair of overalls hanging. I hope the guy found something else to wear when he got <laughs> out. <laughs> Were there many people like, uh, I mean, this is about a month after, I guess, Hitler uh, had had killed himself, right? That was the end of April, and you are there in the early June? We were there for uh, July. Oh, July. So it'd be, it was a couple months after that. But yeah. were there the general population walking around? They or? were walking. They were busy. They were cleaning up. They were stacking bricks in the streets. They were clearing the streets. They finally got some of the streetcar <coughs> lines going. They were working to restore the city. And it, uh, it was impressive to us that they had nothing 
And most of what they did have was being flown into them as far as food and clothing. But they were working to rebuild that city. Did you see a lot of Russian soldiers? Quite a few. We got into some uh, trading with them, too. What kind of trading? Well, let's, let's back up just a little bit. When we came into there, we were using the German or, or German marks that were issued by the new governments, England, France, U.S., and the USSR. All of them printed mark notes from one to 500 marks, except the Russians who also printed a 1,000 mark. We didn't recognize it. Now, a mark was worth a dime in U.S. money. The Russians hadn't been paid in maybe two years, and they had these big bundles of thousand mark notes, and they would buy anything. Oh. If you had a wristwatch, the sweep second hand, they would pay, oh, a thousand, the equivalent of a thousand dollars for it. Wow. But now here you had these 10, 1,000 mark notes. You couldn't do anything with them. <laughs> well, I got in on that. I had a government watch. Well, I reported it lost. And I had to pay a statement of charges. I was on a statement of charges. And I was issued another one. After I paid for it, I went back in and said, look, I found his watch. What do I do with it? They said, it's your watch now. You paid for it. So I sold it for 100 marks <laughs> in, five, in 100 mark units. No, I sold it for, I got $300, the equivalent of $300 for <laughs> it. Um, and they would buy anything. Cigarettes were selling for at least $2 a piece, almost like today. <laughs> but uh, we were getting them either free or for uh, 10 cents a pack or 50 cents a carton. And finally, in about the second or third week in August, they came up with a restriction that you could only send home your pay plus 10% because these were really cleaning up and just sending all this money. They were writing mail or uh, postal orders back to the states as fast as you can imagine. They say on the 3rd of August, the 2nd Armored Division sent home three times its payroll. <laughs> well, did you get any souvenirs when you were in Berlin or your, when you were over in Europe? I got souvenirs uh, in some of that organized looting that I talked about. Mm -hmm. um, if you duck under there or on... <coughs> on the uh, on the big album over there. There's okay, some, I'll take a look at it. Uh, there's some pictures there. Uh, no. Oh, what I we're see. looking for oh. is the, uh, oh, the loose leaf. Um, uh, oh, wow. So you got like some helmets and a flag and... Oh, yeah. Wow. An ammo box? 
Mm -hmm. Well, I used that to send home the flag. <laughs> that was during the war yet. Wow. Piece of shrapnel and ended up in a foxhole I was in. I see that you got some wooden shoes when you were in Holland. Yeah, no, I wasn't. I was in Holland, but I found those wooden shoes in a barn in Germany. Some a, a German group had come through there, military group, and they had confiscated all kinds of wooden shoes out of Holland and had stored them in this farmer's barn and told him they'd better be there when they came back. But when we came, we convinced them they're not coming back here. I see you got an iron cross. Yeah. Where did you get that? That was part of that stuff we had to pick up. And, oh, in that, in that house, the yeah. room you were talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, how long were you in Berlin pretty much until your end of, of, your, of your assignment? Well, about then? six weeks, and okay. that was a good deal, too, because I mentioned this. I wasn't the first one from Cincinnati. I met the first one. He was a fellow I went to high school with. What was his name? It was Milt Sullivan. Yeah. Milt ended up as music teacher at Central High School. But he was playing in the, one of the division bands. And he saw me and he said, hey, we need another tax, sax man. Would you like to join the band? I said, no, I've got a promotion coming and I don't want to give it up. He said, well, just stay while we're in Berlin. We'll put you in on, get you in on a temporary assignment. So in Berlin, I played with a band, which was a nice gig, but it was rough, too. Uh, the first day I was there, started out with a rehearsal from 9 until 11, then a break for lunch. Then we went to the Red Cross to play from one until maybe three or four. Then we had to go back and play a retreat, then eat dinner, and then I was put with a couple of other guys to go to an officer's club to play for them that evening. That would go to one o'clock. Well, I had a lip like a piece of liver. I couldn't blow at the end of it. I tried to blow and air would come out my nose. <laughs> but that's the first time I had played in almost two years. And it murdered, but after a while it was pretty good. And we were the stage band for all of the stars who wanted to play Berlin. So we were on the stage for Jack Benny, Martha Tilton, uh, Bob Hope, Jerry Colonna, uh, Mickey Rooney, and who? Ingrid Bergman, okay and the harmonica player, and for the life of me, I can't remember his name. Larry Adler. So, hmm? Larry Adler. Larry Adler, yeah. So and, we're flying these guys into sort of like, almost like a USO kind of thing to entertain? It was a USO, and our job was to be on the stage. We'd play during, the, while they were changing and so on, and they'd have a theme song. We'd play them on, and then they would have their own piano player who would take over from then, and he or she would tell us what key they were playing in, and then we were supposed to hit a chord at the end of things. Then they'd often give us the wrong key just to make it sound bad for, for us and good for the guy who was up there, but it, it was a lot of fun. What was the venue you were in? Pardon? What was the venue? Where were you? What was it? A it theater? was a a very nice theater that uh, the military had taken over, and USO 
had really dressed the place up, and it was very nice. So this is just two months or so after after Hitler yeah. was gone, mm -hmm. huh? Okay. So was there a lot of, I know there were Russian troops, and then there was a lot of U there U.S. troops. There were French and British, and uh, what they would do was give out tickets to these various companies for these shows. Uh, Americans would get about half of them if it was an American show. And if it was a British show, then the British would get most of them and so on and around. So would they, would, would, would say the British, would they have their own musicians like, uh, like, a, like what you guys were? Uh, they did most of the time, but it wasn't a, a, an organized group that also would play uh, popular music in the afternoon. There'd be a, a small ensemble, or maybe they would use us depending on who it was. And were you just wearing your uniform or did oh, they? Yeah. yeah. So that, you did that for? About five weeks, six weeks. And, and uh, what ended that? Did you, did you get different We were orders? leaving Berlin and I still wanted to hold out for my uh, promotion <laughs> that came in early October, I think. So where did you go after Berlin? Well, after Berlin, we moved to a little town outside of Frankfurt called Hotana. Hot, yeah. And a little tiny town close to Hanau. And I was still with the Signal Group, so I was made wire chief. My job was to set up a telephone system. And I had the whole uh, communications crew, there were 10 of us, I guess. Uh, and what we had to do was run telephone line to the various companies of the battalion, to the various officers' office, and to their quarters and uh, set up a switchboard and operate the switchboard. Well, we realized we had a good thing going here, so we ran a line to our own quarters and we also made a deal with the mess sergeant to run a line from the kitchen to his quarters so he could call his people back and forth. That got us extra uh, food once in a while. And there was an officer who was very friendly with one of the Red Cross girls in a Red Cross hut that was about 20 miles from where our uh, where we were staying, and about halfway to battalion. Well, we had to run a line to battalion. So we figured, let's run another line and leave it there at the Red Cross station. Well, this was going to serve two purposes. First, the officer could call and talk to the gal. But also, we had to patrol the, the lines because they were being cut and damaged. So what we would do is get draw a jeep or a truck and go, go out to the Red Cross place and sit and eat donuts. And if the colonel was coming by, he'd call through the phone lines to get his, uh, his driver in a car and we monitored everything. We weren't supposed to, but we did. We had two people there, one with a phone that hooked in and no speaker in it. So all you could do was listen. And we knew everything that was going on. And if he wanted his car, he would say he was going to battalion. So we would call the Red Cross and tell them to get our guys out on the road because the colonel's coming. 
And this, this, this was a good deal. And we learned that as soon as the colonel decided these men are sitting around too much, we're going to have PT every morning before breakfast. Okay. So the first day they had it, one of our lines went out. So I had to send some guys out to find that break. Well, that meant I was going to have to, if they didn't get back, they had to come back for breakfast. So I sent the other half of my guys to get breakfast so they could change places. Well, that meant we kept them all out of PT. Well, this was a pretty good deal. So the next morning after this, the guy who was working the switchboard would disconnect one phone and call in and say, I've lost contact with such and such. And so we do this. This went on for oh, weeks with this switch. And the colonel was getting upset that all these lines are broken or cut. And I kept saying, Colonel, this, the wire is in such bad shape. If we run it on the ground, it gets run over by the trucks. If we put it up high and run it across along the electric lines, we get a hum in the thing. All we can do is patrol it. So, all right, you patrol it all day, every day. You don't have to patrol it at night. Fine. This worked great. Everybody was happy and we didn't do PT. <laughs> Did you get to uh, travel around much uh, uh, and, and, you know, in Germany or France after, after the war was over where you were still Well, here? yes. I had a cousin with the 75th infantry and I got a three-day pass and a vehicle to go visit him and that worked out nice I got a three-day pass to Paris and I never had a furlough and when the call came in that there were going to be two furloughs available of course we knew this was going to happen and we knew every time I would go in or the uh, uh, wire or the radio chief, signal chief would go in to the first sergeant and say, so-and-so hasn't had a furlough for, since he's in the army for so long. If one should come along, couldn't you give it to him? Okay, I'll do that. And he'd just sit there for a while because that call was going to come through <laughs> from the uh, from company headquarters to the first sergeant that he's got his uh, furlough he can give out. So, okay, you just said you'd give the next one. <laughs> he began to wonder how we knew, but... Uh, mm -hmm. It, it worked. Almost every one of us ended up with a, a furlough to either uh, the Riviera, what I took, or Switzerland. So how was your furlough? You had how many days? You had three days? The furlough? Furlough was for a week, oh, okay. but it didn't start until we got there. And there were four or five of us who had it, one of them was a truck driver. So we got on a truck and he drove down to Par uh, to uh, Nice and it took three days to get down there. And there were places along the way where you'd stop. And uh, they had um, also tents set up operated by prisoner of war along the road where you could stop and get coffee and juice and donuts and cookies. And so this worked out fine. You, you need gas, you stop any place and you can get it. Uh, you always have a place to sleep at night, uh, some kind of a, a USO 
set up, and your uh, furlough didn't start till you got there. So I was gone for two weeks. Oh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. And while I was gone, there was a call for uh, a radio operator in some infantry company, and I was the highest ranking radio operator, and I was going to be sent, but since I wasn't there, I didn't get sent and somebody else went in my place. So I missed out on that to be able to get home in time. Yeah, so you were, I see that you got discharged in February of 46, but I saw you, you were still over in Europe for Christmas. Yeah, I, uh, we were on our way from Frankfurt to uh, Marseille, the, where we were going to be uh, sent home. And I had developed some boils on my face, on my neck, on my butt. And four days down to uh, Marseille, riding on some boils didn't, wasn't very pleasant. When I got down there, I, each night I'd stop and have them drain and so on. I got down there on Christmas Eve and they put me in the hospital right away. So this wasn't all bad because the Red Cross came in on Christmas Day with all sorts of things. And a friend of mine from home came in to visit me. He was a chaplain's assistant, went to look for me and found I was in the hospital right next to where he was. So in he came. And I had a nice visit with him that day. Uh, by Christmas, did you know you were going to be getting uh, out of the service soon? We knew that as soon as there was a ship to take us back, we were on our way home. And it was quite a while before one came, and it was one of these little old victory ships. It took us... 22 days to get back in some of the roughest weather I ever been in aboard ship and we were pretty well on our way and an SOS came from another ship and we started heading for it but still other ships got to it and we were uh, waved off so we got back so Finally, we got to New York. You didn't think you're ever going to get there, huh? Well, I figured sooner or later I would. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you where did you get um, separated from? Where did you from go? From Atterbury in Columbus, Indiana. Okay. Um, were you after that? Did you were you on your own to get back to Cincinnati? Did they provide? No, some they provided me with a bus ticket but not a streetcar ticket to get back to Price Hill. <laughs> <laughs> so where did the bus drop you off at in town? But where the bus station was down, at that downtown. time at 5th and Sycamore, I uh -huh. think. And so I walked a couple of blocks to 5th and Vine to get the night car back to Price Hill. So do you remember when you, when you got back to your neighborhood, who you, who you saw or anything? I got back at 4 a.m. In the middle of the night? In the middle of the morning. And um, our little dog remembered me. He had always slept on my bed until I was gone. Oh. Then he went into my mother's bed. For I came back 4 o'clock. 4.30 or so, I was in bed, and he was with me right away. <laughs> <laughs> did, did, did they know you were you're coming in that day? Yeah, I was able to phone from Columbus, and I was able to phone from New York that I was at least back in the States. So I already got a couple minutes here left, but so what did you, did you know what you wanted to do after you got out? Did you have any sense of what you wanted well, to do? Well, I wanted to go back to school. 
but the course I was taking, commercial engineering, had been discontinued. And I was given a bunch of choices and I tried mechanical and that didn't give me what I wanted. So I left that and took a bunch of night courses for the commercial part, the business end of it. And uh, then finally went to work for, uh, well, the family company and stayed there for a while until my back gave out. What was the, what was the company? Cincinnati Butcher's Supply. Mm -hmm. They were on, well, originally when my father was with them, they were on Central Avenue between Mohawk and Brighton. Oh, okay. And the back end of it was on uh, Central Parkway. That's all down there. There were some breweries down there too, weren't there? There were breweries all over that part of, <laughs> of over the Rhine, you yeah. know. Wait, so that was a family business? Yeah. It was your family? Business? My grandfather had founded it. Ah, okay. So who was, uh, who was, what relatives were working there when you were working there? When I was working there, there were two cousins. Uh, one, well, they were 14 and 12 years my senior, along with the fact that I lost two and a half more years by being in military. So I wasn't going to make it with them. Um, I went on the road for about 18 months, and I loved that. That was great, but that's where my back went out. So what did you do after that, after your back went out? After that, I spent almost a year recovering, and then I went to work for Precision Welder and Machine. Down, They were down in um, over the Rhine then. They're out in Oakley now. And then I left them to represent them and formed my own company in 1960. What was the name of your company? That was G.E. Schmidt Incorporated. And I sold that when I turned 65 to one of my associates. He now has turned it over to his son. And it's been growing pretty well is all it, along. Does it still have the same name? Still the same name. I'm sorry, what, and what kind of business is that? Uh... Resistance Welding Machinery and Supplies. Uh, now that um, doesn't mean a whole lot to most people. <laughs> it is very specialized and um, can be very profitable uh, as long as there aren't too many people in it. Right. And there aren't. So you it's... It, that you got married, you had two kids. Yeah. That's my next question. Yeah. So I, I kind of want to end on, on, on a, we want to know uh, you eventually got married. Can you tell a little bit about your wife? It wasn't eventual. It was only, it was in '48, two years after I got back. Now, your wife. Did you know her before you were in the service? Yes, she was my accompanist in high school, and the solo music solo contests that I went to, and then it kind of broke up during the war, and we got together again after the war. Was she also living in Price Hill? Is that how you reconnected? No, she lived in Fairmount, and, but she went to Western Hills, of course, and that's where we met, although our families knew each other from way back. Her family uh, was Stegner's from Stegner's Soup. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, sure. And, uh, my father and her father were friends, and our grandfathers went to Germany together in 1906. <laughs> uh, we were out of the picture then, of course, but the, their family connection went back quite a ways. And so how many children did you end up having? Have two, a boy and a girl. And he is in Corvallis, Oregon. He's just retired from Hewlett Packard. He had a had a PhD in uh, material science, 
she is a music teacher uh, and a radio operator. Uh, a radio. So yeah, she, she got a little operate. bit of your music and your radio talent. Yeah. Huh? Well, she was with WGUC as an announcer producer. Ah, voice talent and stuff. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, well, we're just gonna. I mean, I got just gonna. We're gonna wrap this up. Okay. But uh, I guess I just I want to uh, first say thank you for doing this interview. But I guess I overall, did you feel like your service was useful, like for your post uh, military life? My service was useful to me, not to the government. They didn't have much for me to do. But yes, I it. If nothing else, it drove in me a desire to see the world. And in the course of that, my wife and I visited all seven continents, and depending on how you count them, between 47 and 57 different countries. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Did you make it back to... Uh France and Germany, the parts that you had been in when you were we in the military? We did, yes. Uh, we visited the uh, place I stayed, the farm I stayed in when we were in Holland. We visited the town that I was in on VE Day. Uh, I didn't get back to Mühlhausen because I hadn't go back after Germany was unified. We were in France, uh, in several of the places I had had been, uh, and I just ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, uh, just want to say thank you so much for doing this interview. It was really, it was really. Uh, Fascinating stories. I really enjoyed it. So thank you very much for doing this, Mr. Smith. Thank you.